Okay, so let's get it started. Let me introduce our speaker. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Beatriz Gonzalez uh, Fernandez. Um, Beatriz Gonzalez Fernandez is a lecturer in Applied Linguistics and TESOL at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, her research focuses on the acquisition and teaching of vocabulary in a second and foreign language. And in particular, Beatrice is uh, interested in looking at how second and foreign language users acquire multiple aspects of vocabulary knowledge and how these data can inform second language uh, vocabulary theory and pedagogy. Her research interest also involves examining uh, the relationships between vocabulary and other linguistic and extra linguistic uh, factors and their effect on second language lexical development. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez uh, Fernandez's most recent uh, research, some of which has appeared in, in applied linguistics, has been an important and key contribution to our understanding of how different components of vocabulary knowledge are acquired. Um, and I'm sure we'll learn more about that during the talk. Um, Bea is an active vocabulary uh, researcher and a committee member of the Vocabulary Special uh, uh, Interest Group of the British Association of Applied Linguistics. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, I met Bea when I was working at the University of Nottingham and she was completing her MA uh, uh, there. And then uh, we were both members of the vocabulary research group at the University of Nottingham while Bea was completing her PhD studies. And I followed, I had the pleasure of following her work since uh, then. So thank you very much, Bea, for joining us today, for accepting the uh, invitation. And the floor is yours. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Anna, for such a flattering introduction. Um, not sure I deserve that much, but anyway, thanks. Thanks a lot. And thanks, everyone, for attending this talk today. I'm very thankful for the opportunity um, to be able to share my research with this community, the UCL Center for Applied Linguistics Research Seminar, and anybody else who has joined from, from anywhere else in the world. That's one of the pleasures of um, the few pleasures, I'd say, of online teaching and learning. So, well, um, as Anna has said, my research interests lie within this area of um, lexis or vocabulary studies. And in particular, I'm interested in the description of the nature or the structure of vocabulary knowledge, as well as how vocabulary is learned in second languages. So that's what I'm going to talk about in uh, today's presentation. I will be discussing some of the existing research on these two topics, on the structure or nature of vocabulary and the acquisition of vocabulary. And I will also present um, some of my, my most recent studies, which provide new insights onto this uh, acquisition and structure of vocabulary knowledge in second languages and English as a second language specifically. So I know that Anna and I are interested in vocabulary and have researched this area, Anna, you know, particularly more extensively, definitely. Um, but I'm not sure how familiar the rest of you are with this area of research. So I just wanted to start my talk um, by providing a brief context uh, about the field of vocabulary studies. So this field of vocabulary studies is a relatively new field of research, being just between 30 and 40 years old. So it wasn't until the 1980s when some language scholars started to uh, denounce that vocabulary was being generally ignored or neglected in language research and therefore language teaching. So before the 1980s, there wasn't much attention being paid to this area of studies in research, but also in teaching and learning. So some of these scholars you may have heard of uh, include Paul Mira, Batia Laufer, uh, Ron Carter, or Michael McCarthy, these last two um, from, from the Nottingham Gang as well, so the University of Nottingham in the UK. Um, so they, they um, made public that this instruction of vocabulary until about the 80s was just limited to the memorization of bilingual word lists. And I think this went on farther than the 80s. I, I bet that most of us here learned vocabulary in our second languages using bilingual word lists, where you were presented with a rather long list of words in the target language and their equivalent in the L2. And you just have to memorize them. You know, 
um, spit that into the, the, the exam the next day, and that was it. That was uh, most of the attention paid to vocabulary in the second language classroom. So this is what made some scholars, uh, particularly Carter and McCarthy, to label vocabulary as the Cinderella of language teaching and language learning. Okay. But this underestimation of the importance of vocabulary in language research and language teaching took a U-turn in 1990 uh, with the publication of the seminal vocabulary book, Teaching and Learning Vocabulary by Paul Nason, who is considered now the father of vocabulary studies. So this book emphasized the critical role of vocabulary in language use, and more importantly, inspired the proliferation of a lot of research on vocabulary studies in recent days. So thanks in, to a great extent to this book, there has been an exponential increase of vocabulary research in the past 30, uh, 30 to 40 years. So in 2020, um, we saw the publication of an entire handbook uh, dedicated exclusively to research on vocabulary studies. So from being the Cinderella of second language acquisition, second language teaching, to having an entire handbook dedicated to all the research that has been published in the recent years uh, on this topic. So now we know a lot, uh, this is still a lot to be, to be found out yet, but we, we have um, uh, great understanding of research now on different topics from acquisition to processing, teaching or testing vocabulary. A lot of which is uh, summarized greatly in this, in this handbook. So due to these uh, research developments, there is no doubt nowadays uh, of the importance of vocabulary knowledge in language teaching and language learning. So I would say that pretty much every researcher and practitioner uh, at the moment considers vocabulary as a critical component of language acquisition and language use. This importance of vocabulary knowledge, I'm using VK from now on on the slides just to, to make them a bit more, more compact, is confirmed by much research evidence. So research keeps showing that there are very strong intercorrelations between the vocabulary knowledge that learners have and their ability to perform in the other language skills, such as how well they will perform on reading comprehension or writing. And some newer research has also found that vocabulary knowledge, our vocabulary knowledge, predicts our success in general language uh, ability. So how well you would learn that target language. So unfortunately, this, uh, despite the importance that vocabulary uh, has for general language competence uh, or competency, it is a very complex construct to describe and acquire and therefore to investigate. So this is because vocabulary knowledge is a what, what is called a multifaceted construct, that is a complex construct that involves the acquisition of different aspects. On the one hand, we've got the acquisition of a large quantity of words. So what is typically known vocabulary size, in order to know vocabulary, we need to know a lot of words in that language, but also achieving quality of knowledge of those words, which is typically referred to as vocabulary depth. So learning vocabulary involves you know, acquiring quantity and quality of word knowledge. And specifically explaining what this quality or depth of vocabulary knowledge involves is what has made the construct of vocabulary knowledge particularly difficult to explain and to investigate. To the point that some scholars, Norbert Schmidt, you may have heard uh, of him if you're interested in vocabulary uh, research, have described this construct of depth of vocabulary knowledge as the wholest, least definable, and least operationalizable construct in the entirety of cognitive science. So this complexity of vocabulary knowledge has made it very difficult to research. And this difficulty in research in vocabulary knowledge means that we still um, don't know much about how vocabulary is learned and how vocabulary is structured in the learner's mind. Therefore, this leaves us with very important questions uh, and answers regard regarding vocabulary knowledge. In particular, what is the nature of vocabulary knowledge? That is, how is vocabulary knowledge structured uh, and how it 
behaves or seems to behave in learners' minds or in learners when learners use those words, and how is vocabulary acquired. So the limited understanding that we've got on these two issues means that there is still an absence of an overall theory of how vocabulary is acquired in a second language. So there is no theory of second language vocabulary acquisition that is widely accepted by scholars. So finding an answer or exploring, finding more details uh, about these two types of uh, questions, these two questions um, will help move the field forward uh, and facilitate a systematic and efficient approach to teaching vocabulary in second languages. That is the importance of answering or attempting to gather some more insights regarding these two questions. Okay, only knowing what is the nature of vocabulary and how vocabulary is learned or acquired by second language learners, we can move the field forward. So for this reason, my recent work has been concerned with addressing these two questions. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, mainly in this, in this presentation. Okay, I'm going to present my findings and conclusions, and we'll discuss them in light of uh, the current literature on these two topics. So I will be dividing today's talk into two main sections, each covering one of these two key research questions. So let's start with the first of these issues regarding the nature or the structure of vocabulary. I'm going to be calling it nature of vocabulary, structure of vocabulary, or conceptualization, which is a, a mouthful uh, word uh, of vocabulary knowledge. I'm, I will be referring to this issue with those terms. So what do we know so far about the nature of vocabulary knowledge? how vocabulary knowledge is structured or seems to be structured somehow in, in the learner's mind or how it seems to behave um, uh, when learners use vocabulary. So there have been many different attempts to describing or conceptualizing vocabulary knowledge. The two most important approaches would be the developmental approach and the dimensions or components approach. So let's start by defining briefly the first approach, the developmental approach. According to this uh, approach, this description of vocabulary knowledge, word knowledge develops from lack, complete lack of or no knowledge at all of the words to fully developed knowledge of a word. There is this approach explains vocabulary knowledge as happening along a scale or a continuum of knowledge from not knowing much of a, about a word to fully mastering that word. So this, um, this approach um, has been explained by um, presenting the different stages of that continuum or, or that scale that learners are expected to go through when achieving mastery of words. So one of the most, uh, the, the main representation of this approach is the vocabulary knowledge scale, which is uh, presented here on the slide, um, which suggests that when we, when second language learners aim at mastering or learn vocabulary, learn a word, they move from not having seen the word at all, to being able to use the word in a sentence. So they go through these five stages, that they specify five stages or levels of knowledge in their attempt to learn a word, okay? So developmental approach, word knowledge develops along a continuum, okay? So we build up our knowledge from zero to full mastery. The second approach is the dimensions or the components approach. These dimensions or components approach states that knowing vocabulary, knowing a word involves mastering multiple different components of the form of the word, the meaning of the word, and the use of that word. Okay, so the main representation or um, the framework that has been employed and accepted by most uh, lexical researchers is the one proposed by Paul Nation in 2013. So we're going to have a, a brief look at this, um, at this framework, which again falls within this uh, approach or of dimensions or components um, approach, right? 
So according to this framework by Paul Nason, knowing a word fully involves knowing all these different aspects of that word, from uh, the, the pronunciation of the word, what he calls the spoken form of the word, to the spelling of the word or written form, um, to being able to connect the written form or the spoken form with the most frequent meaning of the word, called form and meaning, um, to knowledge of the collocations of those words, so how we use the word in context um, in a sentence in combination with other words, uh, the different meanings that a word can take, etc. So he specifies, he lists nine different components or dimensions of the knowledge of a word. And he subdivides each of these components according to receptive and productive knowledge. So he says, not only we should know or we can know nine different aspects or components or dimensions of uh, the knowledge of that word, but we can also know them at two different uh, sensitivity levels. Productively, that means when you are able to use the word without any cue in your speak, uh, sorry, in your speech or in your writing, or receptively, that is when you are able to understand the word uh, when you hear it or when uh, you are reading. Okay, so. This is the best representation or the most widely accepted representation of the dimensions or components approach so far. And don't be scared because obviously this, this uh, feels like something quite quite uh, ambitious uh, to propose, right? That we should know uh, the words, we should know vocabulary at all these different uh, levels of mastery. But this was like an ideal, this was a, a, a practical description of all the different types of knowledge of words that learners can have. And Paul Nation did not expect that all learners, even native speakers of a language, will master each of the words they know at all these different, um, in all these different components. But rather, he said that the more of these components that we know, the merrier, because we would be able to use these words uh, appropriately in most situations. Okay. But again, this is an ideal level of mastery, okay? not the expected level of mastery, even less for second language or foreign language learners of English or any language, sorry. So the dimensions and the uh, developmental uh, approaches are the most common descriptions of vocabulary knowledge. What is the commonality? What do these two theoretical approaches of vocabulary knowledge share? What these approaches of vocabulary knowledge share is that both describe vocabulary knowledge as a multidimensional construct. That is, as a dimension, a construct that involves achieving different aspects or different levels of knowledge for each word. And due to these descriptions, the field of second language acquisition and the field of vocabulary studies have been considering vocabulary knowledge as a multidimensional construct, right? However, research has not typically investigated or validated either of these two conceptualizations of word knowledge. So although they are very important theoretical descriptions and they have been immensely useful um, in, in helping us understand vocabulary knowledge, it is not clear uh, why, how or whether vocabulary knowledge behaves in the way they are proposing. Therefore, there is a need to investigate this dimensionality, this structure, this nature of vocabulary knowledge empirically in practice in order to provide validity to these theoretical descriptions of the construct. Or in other words, we need to determine how well these theoretical descriptions, these major dominant uh, theoretical explanations of vocabulary knowledge represent or match the behavior of vocabulary knowledge in practice. So this is a very interesting question, but only a few studies have, uh, at, have aimed at investigating um, this structure, this multidimensionality of vocabulary knowledge. The studies that um, have aimed at investigating this multidimensionality 
have done so using a technique called structural equation modeling or config for confirmatory factor analysis. I'm not going to go in detail into these um, uh, techniques, but just um, so that you know, they are typically employed to validate theories, Okay, to validate whether theoretical models actually um, behave that way in practice. So this is exactly what we are intending to do here. So what does uh, this previous research tell us about the dimensionality of vocabulary knowledge? In 2012, uh, Kiefer and Lissot measure the vocabulary knowledge of children, sixth graders uh, in the US that had English as their mother tongue, as well as their second language. And they assess this knowledge um, across various types of word knowledge components as specified by pollination, such as synonyms or associations of words or the derivatives of certain words. And what they found is that Vocabulary knowledge was best described as a construct that had three dimensions, three different dimensions, but that were very highly interconnected. So this model is presented on the slides where we see the, we see the three dimensions as three different circles, which are comprised by the various types of knowledge. So, for example, in their study, they have uh, they found that a separate dimension within vocabulary knowledge, which they call vocabulary size or vocabulary depth. And they uh, claim that this was represented by learners' knowledge of synonyms, the synonyms of words, or the multiple meanings of words, or even associations of words. So their conclusion in this study with children, L1 and L2 English children, was that vocabulary knowledge was multidimensional and comprised three dimensions. Later in 2015, Spencer and colleagues examined the same dimensionality of vocabulary knowledge, but this time in L1 English children. Okay, so uh, native speakers of English children whose uh, mother tongue was English. And they assessed knowledge of um, words across various aspects as well, such as uh, vocabulary size, the antonyms of words, and the derivation of words. And what they found was that the vocabulary knowledge for these L1 English children was best described as a single construct, where all the various types of knowledge, all their answers to each of those tests that they were given, build up to creating only one unique construct, which was called vocabulary knowledge. So vocabulary knowledge, not multidimensional, but unidimensional in these L1 English children. More recently, in 2020, Koizumi and Inami uh, assessed knowledge of various aspects of word knowledge, again, by learners of English as a foreign language. Okay, this was one of the first studies uh, assessing uh, foreign language learners. And what they concluded is that vocabulary knowledge was best seen as a two-dimensional construct comprised of um, vocabulary size and vocabulary depth. Okay, but I want you, I want to draw your attention here to this interrelationship between the two dimensions that they, they found. They said size and depth are two different dimensions of vocabulary knowledge, but they are highly intercorrelated at 0.95 level, 0.95. So, so far in the theory, we have these studies providing completely different results, some of them supporting multidimensionality, others supporting unidimensionality with different types of learners. So there is no consensus, or there was no consensus, there is, sorry, no consensus anyway, so far, um, or enough evidence uh, to establish the structure of vocabulary knowledge as being either multidimensional or unidimensional. And therefore, there was a need for further empirical investigation on this nature, this structure of vocabulary knowledge in order to, in order to determine what seems to be the dimensionality. Um, and to be more confident about the results, uh, there should be more research replicating findings across various learner groups. Okay, so those were the gaps in the literature that my research aimed at addressing. Okay, I did so into um, recent studies. Uh, González Fernández and Schmidt, which was published in 2020 in Applied Linguistics, and a study that is uh, under review at the moment, quite close to the uh, finish in line, hopefully. So yeah, watch out for that one if you're interested on this topic. 
And what I did was following Paul Nation's description of work knowledge, um, I created a test battery that assess recall and recognition knowledge um, of various components of work knowledge. Um, and one of the key elements of my research that um, you know, differs from what previous research on the topic had done was that I examined the generalizability of the findings by comparing the results across two different language groups. Okay, so let's move this deep into this, this research. The first of those um, publications, the first of those studies, um, the one that is already out, examined vocabulary knowledge of L1 Spanish English as a foreign language learner. So learners of English with, L with Spanish as their mother tongue. Okay? They had a range of proficiency levels from beginner to advanced, um, to advanced knowledge in English. And I created a test or a battery of tests that assessed their knowledge across 20 different words. The test battery assessed knowledge of these words in four word knowledge components. Four meaning link, that is being able to see the word, the, the, the written form in this case, and uh, understand the meaning or the other way around. Derivative knowledge, so the different parts and um, how the, that word can be converted into its different derivative forms, multiple meanings, which meanings, uh, different meanings that words, those words can um, convey, can take in different contexts, and collocations, which are common um, words which appear frequently with this, uh, these 20 target words. So I assess these four word knowledge components, both in the recall mastery and the recognition mastery. I'm going to include here a couple of examples, but I have um, items, uh, item samples for all the tests um, in the spare slide. So if you're interested, you can ask me about them later. So this is just simple, simply um, an item sample for the recognition collocation test, where learners were presented with um, a sentence in English and a gap just before the target word. So they had to select which was the most appropriate collocate of that target word. Again, this is a recognition um, test or an example of a recall test. In this case, the derivative recall test is the one on the, on the screen where learners had to actually write down um, their derivative form, the appropriate derivative form in different contexts. Okay, again, if you're interested, about these this, um, tasks, you can ask me about them later on. So as the previous research examining this structure or dimensionality of vocabulary knowledge, I employed the same structural equation modeling confirmatory factor analysis uh, technique. And based on nation's uh, framework, um, the first thing that I wanted to do was testing or checking whether the multidimensional description of vocabulary knowledge, which has been employed in the field for many years, was actually supported by my data. So I described the structure of vocabulary knowledge as multidimensional in the following manner. We had a bigger, higher order construct or dimension, which was vocabulary knowledge, the general big construct, comprised of four sub-dimensions within it, which represent the components um, specified by pollination, four meaning, derivatives, multiple meanings, and collocations. And each of those um, sub-dimensions were comprised of the recall and recognition tests, the answers that the students provided to the recall and recognition tests. Just um, an interpretation of nation's framework um, that we saw earlier on. So I submitted this model for analysis just to see how well it fitted uh, the data collected by my L1 Spanish learners. And which were the results? Um, the analysis of this model, this multidimensional model, showed that um, the model was reasonably good. Um, but um, when we analyzed the internal structure of the model, we saw that the level of relationship between the four subdimensions and the vocabulary knowledge higher construct was you know, ridiculously high. So we had correlations of above 0.94. Not sure if you're very familiar with this term of correlation. So correlations um, are a measure between zero and one or 
zero and plus or minus one. So the closer a relationship between two aspects is to one, the stronger the relationship between those two aspects would be. So seen in this model, high correlations of 0 0.94, 0 0.95, 0 0.98 was telling us that those two components were so highly interrelated with each other that is it really, does it really make sense to consider them as different independent dimensions? So that data with those very high correlations between the different, what, what, what were supposed to be different dimensions of vocabulary knowledge was telling us that this model should be re-specified that we should try and test a different model where we do, do not divide these word knowledge components as different dimensions, but rather as levels of knowledge that load into one single dimension. So that's how I, ex I examined, I tested this unidimensional model. I got rid of what seemed to be redundant subdimensions and connected the students uh, recall and recognition knowledge directly to a unique vocabulary dimension, um, yeah, one single vocabulary dimension. So the findings of this model, I'm not going to go into the specific details. If you have questions about, you know, the, the, the analysis or the, the specific values, let me know. But, you know, I don't want to, to get into this uh, at that point too detailed. Um, but in general, what this second analysis showed is that the unidimensional model worked better. Okay, It showed that all the different uh, recall and recognition aspects of vocabulary knowledge loaded very highly onto the vocabulary dimension and therefore confirmed nation's uh, theoretical uh, description that each of these aspects are essential uh, components of vocabulary knowledge and built up to comprise this overall vocabulary knowledge dimension, but that we should not consider them as independent uh, dimensions, but rather interconnected levels of difficulty of the same thing, the same dimension, vocabulary knowledge. I'll let you breathe here, try to take, take in all, all this information. So, in this first study, it was found that vocabulary knowledge is not comprised of multiple different dimensions, but rather should be seen as behaving as a unidimensional construct. Okay, Where the various types of word knowledge specified by pollination are simply different degrees, different levels of difficulty of the same unique construct. So they build up until they comprise this general or overall vocabulary knowledge. Um, this, the findings in this study also concluded that we might need to reconsider this multidimensional description of vocabulary knowledge that had been so um, popular in the field. But of course, this result was found for only one group of English as a foreign language learners. And at this point in the literature, there were two studies supporting multidimensionality and two studies supporting unidimensionality, including that one, including the one I've just presented. So the next following, um, the, the next um, step um, seemed to be uh, the replication of my findings with a different English as a foreign language group, just to check the validity of, uh, where I, of, of my results or the generalizability of these models that I had just found. So this is uh, what, I, what I did in the study that is currently under review. I followed the same approach, the same test battery, um, and replicated the analysis with a very different L1 population, specifically Chinese L1 speakers of English. So English is a foreign language learners um, with Chinese as their L1. Again, they had a range of proficiencies. And what I did in this uh, further publication was to test the multidimensional and the unidimensional components for that uh, group, that sample of L1 Chinese learners individually as well as combining both the Spanish and the Chinese learners into one big group of English as a foreign language learners and um, test the models with the two groups uh, being uh, analyzed simultaneously okay, in a multi-group uh, confirmatory factor analysis. 
So I'm going to present today just the results for the bigger group uh, because they were exactly the same as for the Chinese learners individually. Um, what were the findings? So surprisingly, to some extent, the results showed the same pattern. The multidimensional model uh, seemed not to be really feasible because the correlations were simply too large uh, between each of these uh, so-called different dimensions of vocabulary knowledge. We have correlations of 0 0.99, 0 0.90. So essentially, this is telling us those two things that you consider different are so highly interrelated that they may as well be considered the same thing or part of the same thing. So again, for the L1 Chinese learners individually, as well as the whole sample of EFN learners, the unidimensional model um, was a better description of the data um, in, you know, in this second study. So taken together, these two studies uh, concluded that the multidimensional description of vocabulary knowledge was not supported for any of these two groups of English as a foreign language. And instead, the unidimensional uh, description uh, of, of vocabulary represented learners' vocabulary knowledge better, okay? Both individually by learner, uh, by language, or sorry, by first language, if you want to, um, to call it like that, dividing learners um, by their first language in, and, and examining it independently, as well as simultaneously. So this study also corroborated a, a previous finding for L1 speakers of English, which showed that for those learners, vocabulary behaved as unidimensional as well. So, there might be something there telling us that vocabulary knowledge in general, not only for EFL learners, but also for L1 speakers of English might be unidimensional. So that's what we conclude, concluded, um, that the word knowledge aspects are not known by second language learners as distinct or isolated dimensions, but rather they behave as interconnected different levels of knowledge where the knowledge that you have about one of these aspects, say, for example, the four meaning link, will influence your knowledge and your acquisition of other aspects, such as derivative knowledge of those words. And all these various levels, degrees of difficulty and degrees of knowledge uh, of words would accumulate to create the overall vocabulary knowledge of a learner. So regarding this first research question on the nature of vocabulary knowledge, these studies, um, my, my two um, recent studies, support that vocabulary knowledge should be seen as a unidimensional construct. Okay. So this is uh, the answer to the first, what well, my contribution to the answer of this first research question on the nature of vocabulary knowledge. This part of the studies that I just presented only address this first research question, um, but what about the second question? How can my research inform the acquisition of vocabulary knowledge? Or in other words, how do second language learners seem to acquire the different components uh, or the different levels of um, work knowledge comprised in overall vocabulary knowledge? So this is something, this is a, a question that my two studies cited earlier also attempted to address. So this is this acquisition of vocabulary knowledge or, or the acquisition of any linguistic feature is one of the key questions in second language acquisition or second language teaching. Um, so I wanted to investigate this. How is vocabulary learned? by second language learners. Or in other words, do the various vocabulary knowledge components described by Paul Nason as well as um, the, the, the developmental approach, do they seem to follow a systematic order of acquisition so that second language learners seem to acquire one specific aspect before they acquire others? That was the question that I had in mind. This type of orders of acquisition of linguistic features or developmental sequences, you may have heard um, this term before, have been explored in other aspects of language, such as grammar or morphological rules or phonemes. Um, so, for example, uh, in the case of grammar, uh, 
this kind of uh, research exploring the order of acquisition of grammatical rules has found that um, second language learners of different uh, L1s seem to acquire uh, certain uh, grammatical rules before others. So some of the easiest grammatical rules and the first ones that seem to be acquired by learners are the plural S or the ING inflection. But it's not until much later on that learners uh, are able to, um, to employ the possessive S or the third person singular correctly. So they describe a sequence in which most learners of a language seem to acquire grammatical rules. Again, this has been explored in the past across different uh, linguistic features, but this kind of developmental sequence or order of acquisition research has not been typically um, of in, or not, not of interest, but it has not been typically explored in the area of vocabulary studies. Um, this is mainly, I, I think, because uh, in order to examine this order of acquisition of uh, vocabulary aspects, research need to measure these uh, multiple word knowledge components concurrently. And this is very difficult to do, very time consuming. Um, so most research has been examining um, on, you know, has been focusing on examining individual components uh, first. Okay? That's a logical approach because Again, remember the field of vocabulary studies is quite new, so we have to start by knowing how the, work, the, the aspects uh, work uh, individually and then we'll uh, expand that knowledge. So we are, I think, at this point in time in that process of expanding that knowledge, right, for the nuance to the general um, system. And that's what I intended to, to do. Um, but before um, explaining what, I, what I've done, let's uh, look at what research has done so far in the area of vocabulary studies regarding this acquisition of vocabulary components. So the first, um, one of the first studies that actually um, examined the acquisition of uh, vocabulary components was therefore uh, Laufer and, Gold, and Goldstein in 2004, sorry, 2004, 2004, sorry. So they examined the acquisition of uh, one component uh, of vocabulary knowledge, specifically the four meaning link across their recognition and recall mastery, okay? And what they found was that there seemed to be a reliable order or an implicational scale where learners seem to achieve first uh, the recognition mastery of meaning, followed by the recognition mastery on, of form, then um, the recall mastery of meaning, and finally the recall mastery of form. So this implicational scale that they describe goes from easier to more complex, or from earlier acquired by most EFL learners to the later acquired by most EFL learners. Okay, so they found that there seems to be an order of acquisition of the different um, levels of sensitivity of the four meaning link component. This study was very important in, in this area of uh, acquisition of vocabulary because it suggests that vocabulary knowledge might be acquired following these developmental sequences as well that have been found in previous research. Might be, okay, we have to uh, continue exploring this issue. The limitation of this study is that they only explored one vocabulary component. They only explored how the forming link is acquired, but they cannot inform about whether an order of acquisition of general vocabulary knowledge, uh, including its, its depth of knowledge, the quality of these different um, uh, aspects of word knowledge are acquired. We cannot, uh, it could not inform about acquisition of other word knowledge components. So in 1997, I'm aware that this is a, a bit earlier, but it was a, a better progression of my storyline. Um, Schmidt attempted to actually find an order of acquisition of multiple word knowledge components. Um, he examined the acquisition of associations, uh, spelling, derivatives um, of different words and, and polysemy of different words across four English as a foreign language learners. The problem with this study is that it did not find any reliable or consistent implicational scale in the acquisition of these components, probably due to the limited sample size. But this does not mean that an order of acquisition of word knowledge components does not exist for uh, vocabulary in a second language. Okay? It simply suggested that larger studies um, were needed in order to find this um, order of acquisition. 
So as a result of um, you know, this, this limited account of the order of, of acquisition of vocabulary knowledge, we yet don't know how the different word knowledge components are learned by second language learners. Are some of these components always learned before others? Um, is some knowledge required um, so that other type of knowledge can be developed? We don't know. So my research uh, addressed these issues and tried to explore uh, whether it is possible to describe an order of acquisition of different word knowledge components by EFL learners of English. Okay, I employed uh, the same test battery that I specified earlier, where I measure recall and recognition knowledge of four meaning derivatives, collocation, and multiple meanings of 20 words. Um, as previous research did in this area, I employed a, a type of analysis called implicational scaling analysis. Again, I'm not going into uh, too much detail here, but basically it is a technique that estimates the level of difficulty of the different linguistic aspects that you are trying to investigate and tells you whether some of those aspects seem to be consistently easier or more difficult than others for most participants. So whether there seems to be an order in which a hierarchical organization, a hierarchical order of difficulty of this um, word knowledge aspects by most, followed by most participants in your sample. So if there is, then we can consider that there is an implicational scale of word knowledge aspects so that knowing a more difficult aspect would imply knowing an easier aspect, but not the other way around. So knowing a more complex aspect X would imply knowing Y, but knowing Y would not imply knowing X. So an implicational hierarchical order. So more difficult aspects would imply knowledge of easier aspects. So what did I find? In this first study um, by Gonzalez Fernandez and Schmidt, uh, the one I, I presented earlier um, with L1 Spanish learners of English, we found a reliable and valid implicational scale of development of these word knowledge aspects. So according to this scale, the best known aspect was uh, presumably that one that would appear first in English as a foreign language was the recognition of the four meaning link. Um, we also found that derivative knowledge and multiple uh, meaning knowledge, both at the recognition and recall level, seem to be the most complex for second language learners. And one of the key findings of this implicational scale was that this distinction between recognition knowledge and recall knowledge by learners. So that all the recognition aspects were known before any recall aspect appeared. Okay, so this suggested that when learning vocabulary in a second language, learners need to develop recognition mastery of multiple aspects of words before they can develop recall knowledge of any aspect even the four meaning link. So recall knowledge seems to be very difficult for second language learners to acquire, and it only develops after sufficient recognition mastery has been achieved. So the study found this consistent order of acquisition for L1 Spanish CFL learners, but again, in order to claim that an order of acquisition of vocabulary knowledge exists in English, the findings needed to be replicated. Um, so as I did with um, in, the, in the previous study, I tried to, um, to test whether this order uh, of acquisition, this implicational scale actually applied to learners of English from a different L1 background, as different from L1 Spanish as possible. So yeah. The following study is a replication uh, study um, of the one I just presented. This one is in preparation, hopefully to be submitted very soon. And it basically replicates um, the, the it, 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 sorry, again, it replicates the implicational scale with a non-cognate L1 uh, population, specifically the Chinese uh, learners of English with um, a range of proficiency levels. So it is the same uh, learners as um, presented in the previous study. So the results um, to 
my surprise to some extent actually proved the same implicational scale um, for these L1 uh, Chinese learners of English. And I say to my surprise because I kind of expected some kind of variation given that the two languages were so, so different. Okay, no variation was found whatsoever, um, either in the distribution of recognition and recall knowledge or the distribution of the individual components. So this replication of the implicational scale uh, suggests that this implicational scale, this order of acquisition of foreign knowledge components could be generalizable to English as a foreign language learners in general. And the interesting uh, part of this finding is that if this was the case, it could be possible that some developmental stages might exist in the acquisition of vocabulary components. I'm not saying it is necessarily this one, but I'm saying that it opens the floor to much more research to be done on this area to explore whether we can actually create develop, or, or find developmental um, stages um, for vocabulary acquisition as it has been found for grammar, for example. So just to emphasize um, that much my surprise in this uh, second implication scale, or in other words, to um, further validate the implicational scale and the validity of the implicational scale, the finding, uh, the, the implication scale again was remained the same across the two language populations, the two language groups, despite both of them being very different or having a very different L1 background, but also despite the fact that they seemed to differ in their vocabulary size. So there were statistically significant differences between the two groups uh, at different vocabulary in different, in their knowledge of different vocabulary levels with a tendency of Spanish learners performing better than the, um, the Chinese learners, except at the 2K level where the opposite was found. So. The conclusion here is that despite having different uh, vocabulary levels, the two populations seem to uh, master the different word knowledge components in the same order, which seems to provide some validity to, to this general uh, order of acquisition, at least of the components I explored, I examined. So, brings us to the end of our, of our presentation. What can we make of all this uh, data? What can we make of all this research? What are the overall conclusions that can be extracted from my studies? So first of all, regarding this structure or conceptualization of vocabulary knowledge, the unidimensionality of vocabulary knowledge was supported for two very different groups of learners, both individually and comprised, sorry, and combined. So this suggests that we should not consider a vocabulary knowledge as a multidimensional construct in practice. Um, but indeed, it seems to behave as a unidimensional construct where the different levels of knowledge are simply different degrees of difficulty of uh, knowledge of words that build up to create this general vocabulary knowledge uh, dimension. So, this uh, raises um, you know, a word of caution for researchers or for, and researchers that attempt to explore um, this, this field in the, in, the, in the future, vocabulary research, um, regarding how we describe or interpret vocabulary, regarding the terminology that we use when describing this construct. I'm not saying that my findings are ultimate and everybody has to follow our findings, but I think there are there is enough evidence now that mm, we are not sure in the field of whether we can conclude either unidimensionality or multidimensionality. So until more research is, um, you know, is conducted and more findings supporting one or the other um, are, are presented, we should be careful when we describe vocabulary knowledge as multidimensional, okay? Because it doesn't seem that this different dimensions that we uh, design or we created in theory actually behave as that in learners' um, application of vocabulary knowledge. However, I think that this distinction between the, um, the various core knowledge aspects still has a place in pedagogy. Okay, so when we attempt to teach the different word knowledge components in the second language classroom, 
it is okay to teach them individually one by one, okay? It would be uh, overwhelming for learners to try and present all of them together, oh, because they seem to be to behave as a unidimensional construct, so all of them are presented together uh, at the same time. That's not what this research is suggesting, but it is suggesting that even though we have to present them as independent uh, aspects in the second language classroom to facilitate the process of vocabulary acquisition, they do not seem to behave independently in vocabulary use. Okay, or uh, well, at least when, when doing when conducting vocabulary tests, such as the ones that I, I gave my students, my participants. As for the order of acquisition of vocabulary knowledge aspects, we found again the same order um, across two groups of EFL learners, suggesting that vocabulary knowledge might actually follow some developmental sequences, uh, such as grammar uh, and phonology does. These developmental uh, stages, this order of acquisition um, seems to confirm and extends previous findings that the formatting link appears earlier in the acquisition process. Um, and also that learners really struggle with derivative and multiple meaning knowledge, even at advanced uh, proficiency levels. And also that to acquire uh, knowledge of recall, learners need to develop substantial mastery of recognition knowledge. So by understanding how these various core knowledge aspects relate with each other and how they seem to behave and uh, appear at, be acquired by learners, um, teachers and practitioners can better systematize how and when they introduce the different word knowledge components to students in order to facilitate vocabulary learning. So just final slide of implications. Um, these findings, uh, the, uh, both taken together uh, regarding the nature of vocabulary knowledge as well as the order of acquisition, can begin to inform a vocabulary acquisition theory uh, in second languages. Okay, it suggests that vocabulary knowledge seems to behave as a unidimensional construct. Um, in practice, where knowledge of the different components, the different levels of difficulty develop along um, some kind of continuum, some kind of scale, where knowledge of the simpler aspects, such as recognition knowledge, set the basis, set the foundation for more complex knowledge to develop, such as recall knowledge. These um, new uh, findings uh, of, uh, regarding the acquisition of vocabulary knowledge also suggest that this, we should not see the developmental and the components approaches as two conflicting or two separate approaches, but rather as complementary approaches, where, yeah, the acquisition of vocabulary knowledge involves different uh, components, different aspects of knowledge of words, but they seem to be developing along a continuum in an incremental fashion. Okay, so they build onto the knowledge of the previous. Okay. And finally, the findings uh, seem to provide some more systematicity to the teaching of vocabulary in second languages. So teachers could um, apply these findings, this implicational scale to try and, and decide when to best uh, present or introduce the different word knowledge components to their to their students, depending on their, um, their developmental stage, depending on their proficiency level. So for example, it suggests that the first target still has to be the four meaning link. It's nothing new, nothing different that second, uh, second language teachers were doing, but again, it's again confirmation that um, that should be the first target in the second language classroom, um, that it can uh, develop with a, a lot of input, um, but that, it also tells us that soon we should begin to include, to expose our learners to other um, aspects of word knowledge at the rec recognition level. So while learners um, keep mastering this first uh, forming in recognition uh, aspect, we can still present that, that word in context, in different types of uh, situations, providing rich input so that learners can start to develop intuitions about how that work, uh, that word behaves in other word knowledge components. 
It also tells us that to acquire recall knowledge of uh, vocabulary of words, learners need to master a lot of recognition. So we should try, or teachers should try and provide learners with uh, you know, extensive input, uh, extensive recognition receptive input um, from very early on so that learners can move, can progress through this, this scale and if the aim is for learners to use vocabulary at the recall level, then um, be able to attain that uh, recall mastery earlier on by creating the foundations for recognition mastery first, recognition mastery across various word knowledge components. Okay. And it also seems to suggest that given the incremental nature of the acquisition of vocabulary, uh, where knowledge of one aspect builds onto the knowledge of the previous, multiple exposures and recycling of the same words in different contexts and across different word knowledge types is the only way forward uh, for this acquisition of vocabulary. So that while learners keep um, improving or keep achieving mastery of a, of a specific word knowledge aspect, they consolidate previous knowledge and recycle previous knowledge of easier word knowledge components. Okay, so of course, there is uh, a lot to be done in this field. I leave there a few research questions for future research that um, you might be interested in. Um, but other than that, I'm happy to discuss them later on, but I don't want to uh, continue talking anymore. It's been long enough. Uh, I would like just to thank you um, uh, for, for um, yeah, listening and for all your upcoming questions, hopefully. Um, thank you very much. That's my Twitter account in case anybody is interested in. Thank you very much, Bill. <clears throat> Thanks a lot uh, for a very interesting presentation. Lots of information. And, uh, you know, we already have a few questions in the chat. I have quite a few questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. We have, um, yeah, 25 uh, almost minutes uh, for questions. So let's get started. The first question was uh, posted by Kevin. Uh, Jarik, and he's asking about the, the, the first study, if I remember correctly, um, um, the first study that you presented there, uh, you, you selected 20 words, right? So the question, let me just find it here. Let's go up in the chat. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so basically, how were those uh, 20 words uh, selected and whether word frequency bands played a role in that selection process or how was it established what a useful word was uh, that one could expect to be known at a certain proficiency level. And I imagine especially thinking that your participants were from a range of um, proficiency levels. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you selected those 20 items? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. So yeah, um, you know, the selection of items in any type of research, particularly vocabulary research is key, right? So of course, there was, um, there were some criteria that I, I wanted to follow there. Um, as Anna said, um, that this is uh, quite an important aspect. The participants in my study had different frequency uh, proficiency levels from beginners, quite quite, you know, new beginners with uh, low proficiency to advanced learners who had been living in the, you know, in the in, in an English speaking country for, uh, you know, many years. So they varied a lot in their proficiency level. This was necessary for the implicational scaling study, right? Uh, implicational scaling um, works with data collected at one point in time. So in order to try and create this um, illusion of development in, in uh, over a period of time, you have to select participants at different proficiency levels, okay? But that brought the challenge that, you know, you cannot just assess very difficult words because then your very uh, low proficiency students would not be able to answer any questions and they would be frustrated. So when selecting the 20 target words, um, we tried to uh, target um, words that could be answered by pre you know, pretty much all the participants, as well as uh, words that could not be answered by, uh, by many participants by selecting them from different frequency bands. So we had words from the 1000 frequency band to the 9000 frequency band. Okay, we didn't go beyond that because um, at the four minute link level, we could have attempted uh, other more complex words, I don't know, 14K or, or 20K, but and other aspects such as derivative knowledge or multiple meanings, those words were quite tricky. So of course, the, 
a more frequent a word is, the more meanings it tends to have. So in order to make sure that we had a combination of, yeah, words at different frequency bands, but also words that were interesting regarding their derivative forms and regarding their multiple meanings, um, we selected them from this one to 9,000 uh, frequency range. So of course, that was uh, one of the criteria. Another criteria is that they all had to have at least three derivative forms um, for the same meaning, because it happens that there are some words that have their, you know, like close and closely. The most frequent meaning of the word close is you know, to, to shut the door, but closely as an adverb is not a, a derivative form of that word in that meaning, is of that word in another meaning, right? Um, like the proximity mm -hmm. uh, meaning, the proximity polysyny. So another criteria was three derivative forms for that word with the same meaning. That also narrowed down a lot the, um, the words that we could include in that, in that uh, pool. And finally, they needed to have at least three different uh, polysemous senses or multiple meaning senses uh, with different levels of, uh, you know, as different from each other as possible. So those were the main criteria uh, for our selection of the 20 words. And you know, so that they provided the best opportunity to assess all those different word knowledge components that we wanted to assess. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Bea. We have another question from Andy Wang. Hi, Andy. Uh, and this is indeed a question that I also had. Um, so if we consider uh, vocabulary knowledge as a unidimensional construct, does the way to measure vocabulary knowledge, so should it differ from uh, previous studies that have used nations uh, framework, for example, and if so, in what way? And I was also thinking about this uh, question when you were uh, uh, talking about the implications. So you've talked about implications for pedagogical practices and, and implications for theory. So I was thinking as well about implications for research. So as Andy was saying in this question, uh, does that have this idea of a unidimensional uh, construct of vocabulary? What, what is the main implication for how we assess uh, vocabulary in, 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 um, in, in research studies targeting different components? Yeah, so that is a very good question, and therefore a very difficult question to answer, actually. Um, so I've been thinking very carefully about this, and, you know, I'm, I'm quite positive that we're on to something there with the findings of unidimensionality here uh, being supported. Um, you know, the, the more I read about it, um, I've, I've also attempted other models myself, compare them. The more I do that, you know, in the background, the more I realize that we are on to something here. But it's still two studies, it's still three studies out there supporting this uh, unidimensionality. I don't want to make this claim that, oh, because there is a unidimensional construct, you can only measure one, uh, as one component, and then it seems like you're measuring the entire construct. That's not one, because that's something that has been suggested to me previously. No, assessing only one component would not be sufficient to say, oh, we are measuring vocabulary knowledge anyway, because it's unidimensional. So, okay, yes, it is unidimensional in the sense that they, the, the different word knowledge components, the different word knowledge aspects uh, that learners can, can have mastery of don't behave separate from each other. So when they use one at the back of their mind, there seems to be some knowledge of others going on. So they are based onto each other, but they are uh, known at different levels. They have different, they post different um, uh, difficulty um, levels for the learners. And we see that more clearly in the implicational scale. So that means that if we attempt to assess only one word knowledge component and we pick an easier one, our estimation of the learner's general vocabulary site might be overestimate, uh, an overestimation. And if we pick a very complex one, it might be an underestimation. So still, in order to get, you know, to assess overall vocabulary knowledge precisely to a precise level, the more aspects we assess, the better, the better indication of what overall vocabulary knowledge is. But I think that we could um, pick a couple of word knowledge components if in, in research when our intention is to get a general estimation of vocabulary uh, size. 
or uh, sorry, of vocabulary knowledge, but a proxy of that vocabulary knowledge rather than this is the vocabulary knowledge that our students have. So mm -hmm. it could be, um, again, it has to be supported by more research that you know maybe selecting a recognition a component and a recall component uh, to try and get um, you know two different levels of difficulty of vocabulary knowledge might start to provide some indication of learners um, vocabulary knowledge but it is not sufficient to determine this is the overall vocabulary knowledge that our students have because that unidimensional model even though yeah it confirmed unidimensionality we could see that then how each of the components loaded onto the construct varied slightly they all loaded very highly but there were some that loaded more highly than others suggesting that they, those might be um you know a, a better representation of vocabulary knowledge uh, or than others so if we select one that is not that good a representation of vocabulary knowledge we would not be getting a, a very accurate estimate um, or the the other way around so i'm not intending that people from now on only assess one word knowledge component and claim, oh, because this is unidimensional, it doesn't matter. Um, we can do that understanding that is just um, some kind of proxy um, of vocabulary knowledge when our aim is to connect, for example, vocabulary knowledge with something else, not when our aim is to investigate vocabulary knowledge in detail. For mm -hmm. that, we still have to go for multiple word knowledge components because each of them contribute to vocabulary knowledge slightly differently. Yeah, and I think, thanks a lot, Bea, and, and I think, uh, um, I mean, at least that's the way I in interpret this uh, finding as well, that, you know, what you're saying is not that there are no dimensions or there are no, uh, sorry, there are no aspects or components Levels, yeah. of vocabulary knowledge. I mean, the components are there, but yeah. this is more about how they are represented or how they are uh, connected. So in practical terms for, for research, as, I as you were saying, if you still want to get a comprehensive picture of, of, of the different aspects of vocabulary knowledge that have been developed after a particular, I don't know, um, you know, instructional approach or from a particular treatment, then you still need to measure all those different aspects. So it's not so much whether the, the aspects are there or not, whether they exist or not, but how they, they represent. Is, would you agree with that? Or Exactly, yes. So as I said, the aspects are there. So we all know as teachers that there are some there is a difference between our students' knowledge of collocations and our students' knowledge of form, the forming in link. We know that there is a difference there. So that um, conceptualization, um, sorry, that unidimensional model is, informs theory more than practice in that sense. So it's telling us big, big causes, they exist, but they are not different dimensions. Mm -hmm. And the worry of employing, of considering as different dimensions is that we may want to, for example, I, I if we consider that, I don't know, vocabulary size and vocabulary depth are different dimensions, I may want to be, temp I may be tempted to see whether one predicts the other. And I might indeed find a prediction effect, but the prediction effect based on the fact that they are the same thing yeah. rather than the fact that they one predicts the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that's what I mean by you know, being cautious in research because the way we yeah. name things can lead, even though it seems it doesn't really matter, the distinction, some distinction is there. There are different levels of difficulty, different dimensions. Who cares? Well, it is important for this reason. Yeah. Going forward, we might attempt to do things that we should not do or it more more importantly we might interpret certain effects that we find out there as you know an effect of one uh, different dimensions over another different dimension when the reality might be you know that they just simply predict each other because they are each other the same <laughs> exactly to the same ex yeah to, to some extent the same yeah and that's really related to uh, another question that we have from the audience from uh, Bronson uh, Hui. Um, she's saying, uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. In light of your unidimensional model, do you think there is a need to standardize the terms that vocabulary researchers use? So for example, dimensions, aspects, components, facets, and types of lexical knowledge? Yeah, and I, I, think, I think there is. Um... In that paper that is hopefully <laughs> to be published soon, I discuss uh, this issue of terminology. And I suggest that we should um, do it. First of all, not call the components dimensions, 
because that, that term dimensions in statistical uh, analysis in statistics basically refers to two different things that might or might not be related, but they are two, two different things. And I think most you know, vocabulary scholars, whether they care about this terminology or not, they would agree that we don't think they are completely different things. Like who thinks that derivative knowledge is completely different from the form meaning link? When actually the entire knowledge of, uh, you know, the derivatives of a form depend on knowing that form before. Mm -hmm. Right. So we know that they are highly interrelated. We've been claiming that forever, but we haven't translated that into this terminology of what a dimension really means in other fields of, of, of research. So, yeah, I think that we should try and avoid using dimensions to refer to these different world knowledge components. So you, have, you will see, maybe you will notice that in my uh, forthcoming studies, I, tr I call them components or the components approach. I try to just um, ref you know, ref refrain from using dimensions and yeah, whether to call the rest types, aspects, facets, that's a bit more complicated. Um, and one thing that I've noticed while writing my, my own research is that, yeah, avoiding the dimensions is there, is easy, but it can become very repetitive to keep using components, 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 aspects, aspects, aspects. Um, so I think there is, uh, you know, we have to keep exploring that. I certainly support to stop, you know, to stop using the term dimensions to refer to these um, various levels of knowledge. So in my in my research, I try to call them again aspects of world knowledge, mm -hmm. levels of knowledge, degrees of knowledge, in order to to make sure that um, you know I don't mislead uh, future researchers onto this. You know, they are different things essentially. But that's interesting because a lot of people would use dimensions as well as seen as a synonym of uh, aspects or or components. So exactly. I mean, I suppose, uh, yeah. And and uh, I mean, this is not unique to vocabulary research, right? Like terminological issues are always, uh, uh, um, you know, are always there uh, in in research. But I think that's really this is really uh, helpful, I think, for all of us to to kind of think twice about the terms that we're using and always specify the kind of, you know, uh, meaning uh, uh, or how we're using them in, in a particular study. Excellent. I wanted to ask you, Bea, about uh, the, the implicational scale that you showed and um, uh, um, really interesting uh, findings. And I think, uh, you know, yeah, I find it really uh, exciting that, that we see that very similar, well, the same pattern really with, uh, with the learners of uh, different backgrounds. So if I remember correctly, you show that uh, uh, collocational recall uh, was learned before uh, form meaning recall, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So is that interpret? So do you interpret these as collocational knowledge not being particularly more difficult to acquire than you know other components as the uh, four meaning link? Okay. So yeah, that that's again a million pound question. Um, so you will notice that I didn't go into that um, during, for this general description um, because. You know, it's a, it's a difficult finding, and I think it was aff uh, affected by the way I assessed those two types of knowledge. I'm going to explain that a bit more. Regarding recognition, the recognition level, so if we focus on the blue um, spark yep. of the scale, I think, to me, that looks pretty mm, reasonable, to be honest. Um, at least in the way that I assess these types of knowledge, all right? So derivative knowledge and particularly multiple meaning knowledge have not has not really been assessed much in the field. So we don't really know the extent. We, we claim it is difficult, but we really don't know the extent of their difficulty when compared to other world knowledge components. So the same collocation knowledge has been assessed and it has been claimed that it's difficult. Derivative knowledge has been assessed individually as well, and it has been claimed to be difficult for advanced learners, but we have not previously compared them with each other. Yeah. So this, can, I think, um, particularly based on research that shows that the collocation recognition is not as much the problem as it is recall uh, knowledge of collocations. So that part of the scale, the blue part of the scale, to me, looks, um, I, I believe that's, that's, there is something there. I believe that's how it can, uh, it can progress. 
regarding the second part, which is the complicated part of this of these findings, where we see that collocation recall um, seems to be easier than forming in recall, there is an explanation there based on the uh, on the tasks, the tests that I used. So in those those two tasks ended looking uh, quite similar. So one thing that I did that. I, I encourage future researchers to explore in a different way, just to see how it, it would affect implication of scale, is that I assessed collocation knowledge by asking the students to produce only the collocate rather than the entire collocation, and to recognize only the collocate rather than the entire collocation. So I think that facilitated uh, you know, the, 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 the task for learners. That means that the students had to produce simply one is, uh, had to recall one collocate for that uh, for a word in a sentence. So they had to fill in one gap in, okay. in a context. That was exactly what they had to do for the four minute recall task. They were given a sentence, they were given a gap, they, they didn't have a highlighted uh, node of a collocation, but there were still collocations there inevitably when it's a, a context, right? When the words are presented in some context. So they essentially had to fill in one gap in each of those two tasks with the difference that the collocates targeted in the collocation test were from 1, 000, 1 to the 3,000 frequency band and the words targeted in the four minute record were from the 1 to the 9,000 frequency yeah. band. Remember, uh, I said earlier. So obviously that made that recall of one uh, item easier in the collocation recall than it was in the four minute recall. When learners had to recall easier items or higher frequency items from one to three K or more difficult items from one to nine K. So I, I think, think that was the reason for that finding. Okay, so, 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 okay, so, it so might I would be, like to say the other way around. Actually. Yeah. No, okay, but, but that's, that's really interesting. So it might be that, the, you know, I mean, collocational knowledge might be more or less difficult, of course, I mean, depending on, as you were saying, how you're measuring it, but also, uh, you know, the, 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 the the, the frequency of those uh, of those collocates, right? So it might be a frequency fact effect that you're seeing here more than a, a component uh, yes. difference. I mean, I still I found it really interesting because it's still it's not it didn't at least uh, the way you measure it and how you assessed it it, it didn't come up as the most challenging or most difficult aspect of vocabulary knowledge, which is also in line with what some studies uh, are, are, are finding. So, you know, I found that really uh, exciting. Um, let me see, because we have more questions here in the, uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, so while, while you are, you know, reading, just, just to emphasize that I'm not claiming in this interpretation of the implicational scale, I'm not claiming that collocation knowledge is not difficult. That's not what I'm aiming at. It's just compared to other types of knowledge, it might not be the most difficult for learners. And also that, you know, I think that this way of testing collocations in a different manner improves our nuanced understanding of how collocations work. So yeah, collocations in general might be difficult, but when we are actually measuring only knowledge of a collocate and giving the word, that seems to facilitate um, the process or when we are assessing very simple collocates. So the, the effect that the frequency of the collocates uh, can have on this on these results. So it's more nuanced understanding of collocational knowledge and why and how they might compare to other word knowledge components. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going, sorry, going through all the comments. I mean, uh, loads of uh, thank you comments and positive comments about uh, uh, the talk and the responses. Uh, we have another comment here kind of supporting your, uh, uh, you know, findings of the unidimensional uh, nature of uh, vocabulary knowledge and saying that your research has scientifically confirmed what we've kind of intuitively been doing uh, at various levels for, uh, for our learners. Um, you're the fairy godmother to ensure that Cinderella shall go to the ball yes. <laughs> and, uh, and meet their Prince Charming call vocabulary instruction. Uh, exactly. That's a that's a good good. good that was fantastic. <laughs> uh, so also for non grammatical lexis, we cannot separate word uh, knowledge from world uh, knowledge. So I'm firmly in the uni camp. Um, so any other thoughts that you had about that? 
Sure. Can you can you repeat that? Yeah. For uh, uh, so saying, yeah, uh, supporting the unidimensional oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, nature, and that this is what we've been intuitively doing with yes, Leonard. Yes. Also, for non-grammatical lexes, uh, we cannot separate word knowledge from world uh, knowledge. So um, I'm firmly in the uni, so unidimensional uh, uh, camp. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I ha obviously I have. I don't want to overstep here because my study was very um, focused on vocabulary aspects. Um, but given the connection between vocabulary and grammar, or some aspects of grammar anyway, um, I think that um, you know, word knowledge and world knowledge um, is a little okay. The difference between those two dimensions that which they may be calling dimensions at the moment might be more than the difference between the elements that I have assessed here. So obviously work knowledge uh, in, involves all these different um, types of knowledge that uh, are, are restricted to the world level, whereas world knowledge will bring far more um, factors towards it. So it might be that because of the influence of those other external factors, those come up as as different dimensions. Um, I really don't know what will happen in that in that um, extent. Even if they come up as different dimensions in that field or in that area of research, I think the intercorrelations will be very high. And that's something that we have to continue um, exploring in the future. It's not only whether this model it fits or, or or seems to um, you know to provide a good fit with multiple dimensions is also how those dimensions interrelate. Because my multidimensional knowledge, uh, looking at the goodness of fit of the model, so those uh, statistical values that we take as rule of thumbs, was a good model. So I could have concluded this model fit the purpose. I'm not moving it any, any further. It's multidimensional. But actually, we have to explore what happens underlying it, what happens with the internal structures here. So it might be, I'm not sure, that world knowledge and world knowledge um, um, differ enough to be to come up as two different dimensions. But I also think that they will be very highly intercorrelated. Mm -hmm. So we have to focus on that intercorrelation. They cannot be considered two completely separate things. Uh, and I think neither in my research, and I, I, would, I would venture to say in that research either, world knowledge and world knowledge, yeah. two interrelated. But it might be that there are other factors that might affect and make it two different dimensions if interrelated with each other, yeah. But I think in language, I think in language knowledge, those kind of independent or uh, totally isolated dimensions would probably not exist in the way that we have been calling them or dis describing them or, or the terminology that we have been used to describe them uh, so far. I think the interrelationships are there for most of what we do when we apply language. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you um, very much. I think, yeah, time's up. It's 1.30 now Hello. here in the UK. <laughs> thank you so much for, um, for your time and for uh, responding to all these questions. Thanks, everyone, for attending this talk. I'm going to include in the chat the information about our next uh, talk, um, which will take place on the 17th of November. And we'll have Dr. Michael Berry from um, University of Wollongong, uh, Australia. So let me just um, put this in the um, chat. You have the link to the registration um, as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming, and we hope to see you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, everyone, for your patience. Any